we we'll go to the sec second session in the second session we have an, an interesting topic which will be useful in our day to day practice especially to the post graduates and students and the practicing physician this topic the will be guidelines in the management of diabetic ketoacidosis it will be presented by dr arun s menon endocrinologist lisi hospital and it will be moderated by dr jils george professor and head medicine government medical college now working at dc hospital over to you dr jils to conduct the program thank you good evening all my friends diabetes mellitus is one of the major a uh, major health problems we are seeing in our every, everyday clinical practice it has got very high morbidity and mortality but it has got only, only three acute emergency or acute complications in in our, uh, in our clinical practice among the three major complications of diabetes mellitus hypoglycemia stands first second is the diabetic ketoacidosis and third is the hyperosmolar coma or honk among this diabetic ketoacidosis carries a high morbidity as well as mortality it was around 15 to 20 percent previously but but with uh, because of the improved awareness and uh, other facilities the mortality has come down to 5 to 7 percent in our country today uh, with us Dr Arun S Menon an eminent speaker and endocrinologist to enlighten us more about the management detection and and assessment of diabetic ketoacidosis during the management of such acute emergencies Dr Arun S Menon has graduated from Trivandrum Medical College he did his MBBS as well as MD from Trivandrum Medical College and did his post graduation and a, and FRCP from Newcastle University UK now uh, he joined he uh, he joined in Amrata Medical College he was the professor there and now he moved to Lissy Hospital and he is presently the head uh, department of endocrinology and diabetes in Lissy group of hospitals in Ernakulam with this few words i invite dr arun s menon for his uh, lecture please good evening everyone uh, thank you jil sir for the kind introduction uh, it's always a uh, privilege to uh, be part of api uh, and uh, it's been a long association if uh, been involved for the last more than 10 years although inactively you but i am al almost all of you i know personally very well um so i am actually using the slides of uh, you probably most of you would know the phfi course that we run um uh, in diabetes uh, large these are these are slide sets that are actually made um by uh, Dr. professor mohan from chennai Uh, so i'm just taking those slides uh, and using it because uh, it's a fairly good slide set now uh, it's a little bit embarrassing to talk to you about dk because uh, i think the collective experience of dealing with dk in this room uh, will pale uh, in comparison of what uh, i would be talking on because we all have uh, burned our fingers uh, managing this you know many cases we have managed successfully but the one that we didn't manage successfully is the one that will uh, that will always we will always remember you know one that we made a small mistake um but as sir had said earlier uh the the mortality has come down significantly when it comes to dk uh, that is largely because of one uh, the fact that most of these patients who um who develop dk uh, have fairly good access to care at least in our part of the country and uh, most of us are 
uh, including journalists, uh, including our junior doctors, are fairly good at managing this. Still, there are banana peels that uh, they fall into at times because we just take it for granted. We think oh, it's all fine. But sometimes it's a basic mistake that actually uh, costs lives. Basic mistakes. And I, again, all these things you know very well. So please take this as a revision and uh, I'm not going to talk anything new uh, in this. Perhaps except for one or two things like perhaps euglycemic decay or one of those. But otherwise, uh, most of these things are fairly straightforward. Uh, so in the next maybe 25 minutes to half an hour, I'll just quickly run through these slides. So this is a typical case that, uh, that presents to uh, the casualty. Uh, unfortunately, we keep on seeing this, isn't it? Still, despite we making diagnosis of type 1 very early on, and, uh, you know, of course, new onset type 1, uh, they can present. It's unfortunate that the diagnosis uh, may be made late. Um, however, we still have patients who have, we have started insulin, we have counseled properly, we have told the relatives, unfortunately because of the, uh, the social media, I would say, if I, if I can dare say that, uh, of saying that we will stop insulin, you know, uh, idiots in the social media telling uh, young people you can stop insulin and go on for some sort of magic treatment. We all see, I'm sure all of us are seeing on a daily basis, patients who stop insulin and end up in DK and end up in one of our hospitals. That is very unfortunate, but unfortunately it's not something we can change that quickly. But so these are typical scenarios we see, you know, young people who should not be in this situation, but who end up uh, in this situation. And we know what is a test that we want to do uh, in this sort of situation. And what is the two aspects of treatment? We'll come to that. So uh, we all know DK is a metabolic decompensation. Why is it occurring? Again, nothing new. It's severe insulin deficiency that is causing this. Uh, and it's it's very simple when you look at it. It's all three only three things. It's hyperglycemia, it is ketosis, and metabolic acidosis. So this is, these are the three things uh, that is happening. But this leads to a kind of a, uh, a chain of events, which unfortunately, uh, if not managed in time, uh, leads to problems that are irreversible. Now this is uh, an interesting kind of uh, diagnostic criteria which is clinically fairly useful. Uh, although many times we don't necessarily put it as mild, moderate, severe. I'm sure many, many of us do, you know, we do put. But this is how that classification goes. Uh, again, just to remind you guys, uh, I'm sure you, all of you know this very well. But I think one of the points in this is the fact that the plasma glucose level, okay, if you take that first, the the, the uh, severity of plasma glucose level is not necessarily a marker of severity. You can see that, isn't it? It's all put more than 250, more than 250, more than 250. So you can, all I'm trying to say is, you can get mild decay with sugars, which are 300, 400. You can get moderate decay. You can get severe decay. So blood sugar reading should not be used as the marker to say, oh, this is severe decay. It's not. And again, I'm sure we all know this. But it is actually the arterial pH and the bicarbonate. And that's what is said there. So uh, when you have less than 7, it becomes severe. Anything between 7 and 2.4 is uh, moderate and uh, in between is mild. So that arterial pH is quite crucial, especially in setups where it can be done. And again, we are fortunate to have most places we can do that these days. Urine ketones, this is always another uh, problem we have, isn't it? Because people will always be waiting for the patient to pass urine and, you know, urine ketones. So you go for the water rounds and ask, oh, what's the urine ketones? The patient hasn't passed urine or the patient didn't give uh, a sample. So I think, again, most setups now have uh, serum ketones uh, that is available. So that, is, that problem has been circumvented in a way by that, uh, this thing of serum ketones. And again, you can use a cutoff of uh, less than 1.5, 1.5 to 3, and more than 3 uh, to decide on uh, severe, uh, I mean, mild, moderate, severe. So serum ketones are a very helpful tool, and everything should be there in 
any acute emergency uh, setup which, uh, which deals with such patients. Um, and anion gap could be used at that point. I mean, in, in theory, that also that is there, but by that time we would have made a diagnosis of what the severity is based on all that I've said, the arterial pH, the bicarbonate, the ketones and all that. And perhaps the most important thing is the mental state of the patient. So if a patient is very alert and doing well, that doesn't mean that it is not moderate severe, but then there is a high chance of, but the other way around, if patient is drowsy, then you have very little time on your hands and this patient needs to be, you know, to, uh, taken through uh, the process very, very quickly. So that mental status is an important thing that, uh, that people should not forget. Uh, I, I think I'll s skip most of this. These are things we know. So what are the precipitating causes? Uh, the most common is still omission of insulin, unfortunately. But infections certainly uh, are a major issue, and we have all seen during COVID times, as well as following it, number of cases of DK uh, for, uh, dur uh, during that period because of various infections. Uh, other precipitating causes, the, the usual causes that we all know, the MI, the CVA, the acute pancreatitis and all that, and add to that is that drug, the SGLT2 inhibitor. You know, everybody's a blue-eyed boy, but unfortunately when it comes to DK, we have all seen cases of DK uh, with SGLT2 inhibitors. It's not that common, fortunately, but still, this is one of the concerns when people use uh, SGLT2 inhibitors in type 1 or the kind of type 1, type 2. There are a lot of patients who are neither, you know, you can't be 100% sure whether they're type 1, type 2, that sort of patients. It is perhaps better to avoid SGLT2 inhibitors in those, those group because you never know. I mean, there might be benefits to be had and I've heard people, I mean, there's quite a lot of evidence about uh, SGLT2 or SGLT1 to uh, benefits in type 1. But till, the, uh, till uh, we have more clear answers, it's best to avoid SGLT2 inhibitors in type 1 diabetes. Then uh, another group which uh, is also slowly growing is the insulin pump patients. Um, and uh, they are obviously because uh, the problem, as you know, in pump is that if there is a mechanical failure or a pump uh, or if there is a cannula issue, the thing with pump is that there is not enough insulin reserve in your body. So the moment that, uh, you know, the, the, the insulin um, infusion stops, there is no real insulin reserve in your body and patients go very quickly in decay. It's not that common, but still, uh, as the number of uh, pump patient, pump users increase, it is bound to increase. I'll not go too much into the mechanisms. The pathophysiology is something which you all uh, know very well, but it's all insulin deficiency and increase in counter-regulatory hormones. And what that does is a reduction in the glucose utilization. And, but then what happens is the increase in free fatty acid, which is what causes the ketogenesis. And ketogenesis would be an increase in uh, beta hydroxy uh, 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 beta hydroxy uh, acid as well as acetoacetic acid and all that leads to acid uh, acidosis add to that is a dehydration which causes renal failure so um, the it is really the acidosis caused by uh, the ketone body production that is causing the problem symptoms all of us know the common symptoms but remember they can present with acute abdomen uh, which is, again, uh, we have all seen cases that present like that, uh, especially in young people f when it's the first presentation. Of course, type 1, once you have a diagnosis of type 1, we all know what, what we would look for first. But this is when a newly diagnosed case comes. That is when we would be thinking about this. Science-wise, again, uh, you know, you have to think of, uh, you know, there is multiple systems could be affected. But again, as I said earlier, it is the... Uh, changes in mentation uh, that should be that you should keep in mind. So typically, the initial lab values would look like this uh, in patients with DKA. Uh, as I said, uh, blood glucose reading would be typically more than 250, with strongly positive uh, urine ketones or serum ketones, which you choose to do. 
a bicarbonate of less than 18. Uh, and sodium and potassium don't depend on that. As you know, there is pseudo hyponatremia that can happen because of very high uh, blood sugar. So uh, that can happen. Sometimes you might find it is the sodium is low or normal or high. You will obviously have to correct the sodium based on uh, the based on that formula uh, of uh, because as the glucose level goes up, there's a uh, the lab estimated sodium would be low. Uh, potassium, the same problem. Although there is a significant potassium deficiency in this patient, when you look at the serum potassium, it could be either normal or even high. So you should have a low threshold to replace potassium. I'll come to that in the next. A few of this thing. So general principles, I'm not going to go through this. I mean, this is this is what you typically do. So if you, almost all hospitals have a good, um, good uh, guidelines for DK and these are the things that would be there. These are basics that uh, I don't, I shouldn't be uh, taking step by step uh, with this audience. Um, with mild, um, now, this decision, I mean, when I say mild ketoacidosis and managing it with uh, this thing, it's it's always best taken by a senior physician, I would I would think, because uh, what we shouldn't err on is uh, looking at a severe or a moderate one as mild and starting to treat without this thing. So I would err on the side of treating these cases with IV fluids and IV insulin and all that, rather than going for uh, this kind of an approach. But a senior physician who sees or an experienced physician might take this decision, which is fine. Because the decision really there is dependent on whether the patient is able to tolerate fluids orally and is not vomiting. That is really where you can take the decision. Because if you can tolerate fluids and if it's only very, very mild uh, parameter changes, Certainly, you can continue to uh, hydrate the patient orally and uh, give insulin um, subcutaneously and then manage it accordingly. But if you are not confident or if you don't have the staff to look at these patients or if you are in a setup where the staff are not trained to do it, then it's better not to, uh, to take that risk. And moderate and severe, of course, these patients are managed in a uh, medical high de dependency on it because they need very regular monitoring and care. So the three things when it comes to managing DK are one, the IV fluids, uh, and we all know how we need to start very rapidly with the fluids. Uh, most of these young people will tolerate uh, very large quantities of fluid um, up first up uh, because cardiac wise usually it's not an issue. Uh, you should be careful if you're managing this in patients who have, you know, much slightly more elderly. Uh, but mostly type 1 DK, you would expect that these are younger patients. So, uh, depends on the shock and depends on the urine output. You start, uh, you know, correcting the IV fluids uh, and manage that um, accordingly. So, this is usually, uh, usually not a very difficult thing and most of us will do that very very well. It has to be saline and it has to be at least, uh, as we say, a four to five liters deficit that these patients have, which need to be corrected in the first 24 hours. So that, again, different protocols would say differently. They would say in the first hour you give one liter. Some would say first four hours give 500 each. So it doesn't really matter. It's what works in your setup and that's what you should use. But just keep in mind that four to five liters uh, in 24 hours is what you would need to correct. Uh, and obviously, this monitoring this with blood pressure and with all other parameters, uh, including urine output. The next thing, which is perhaps the most important thing, is f because for correction of acidosis, what you need along with fluids is insulin. And there again, I would err to the side of that IV route. And in IV route, uh, you really look at uh, using the insulin infusion. Again, there are different pa different. Uh, protocols or different guidelines that are used. Uh, there are fixed uh, insulin uh, gui um, infusion uh, protocols that are used, which is most, there will be a six unit per hour to start with and then slowly reducing it, which is, which is trying to make it simple, but at least you know that uh, you have a fixed amount rather than people calculating it and calculating and getting it wrong. 
but this is typically what they say is about 0.15 units per kg as IV bolus followed by 0.1 units per kg so a 60 kg would person would have about 6 units per hour so that's what you start off and then you look at the rate of fall of blood, uh, serum glucose uh, and only if you know if the fall is not much then in hours time you would uh, you know if it is less than 50 to 70 fall then you would actually double the dose but most people can be managed by about six units uh, per uh, six units per hour uh, insulin infusion and then the next thing which is when the blood glucose reaches 250 so you have uh, again some protocols would say 200 some would say 250 the advantage of keeping 250 is that they will not go into hypo because there will always be a time time lag about all these things so once the blood glucose reaches about 250 uh, then you have to chase the fluids so so far you have been giving normal saline or half normal saline depending on the sodium and at that point you actually change to either a dextrose normal saline I mean again these are all basics and I'm not saying anything new here uh, so, uh, and once that is done, uh, then you can balance it with the infusion. So, the aim here is not to stop the insulin infusion, but balance it with uh, dextrosaline on one side and insulin infusion on the other side. Uh, and once you have, so these are again basics as to how you move forward. Uh, so, once you have, uh, you will continue the IV infusion till the patient is able to eat and then you actually uh, once you give the subcutaneous insulin you continue the IV infusion for about 30 to 60 minutes and then uh, stop after that um, I think these are probably an overkill I'll go through this yeah now the other aspect so if we have talked about IV fluids we have talked about insulin the most and the third is really serum potassium. Why is this so important? Because still, one of the commonest causes, I would say one of the, one of the commonest causes of losing life is hypokalemia. So hypokalemia is a dangerous thing. And if we have created it, then it becomes very unfortunate. So because, of, because we know that there is an overall significant uh, uh, loss of potassium in this situation. So they are significantly potassium deficient so it will have to be replaced in almost all patients so what you would do is if the potassium is between 3.3 to 5 so even when potassium is normal you still need to give 20 millimoles of potassium with every liter of fluid okay so because we don't wait for that to go down because it might be too late whereas if it is less than 3 you should give uh, uh, you should give 40 millimoles of potassium so even those more than if of course if potassium is more than five at that stage you don't give so it is important that even in normal potassium you continue to replace potassium so that when the deficiency hits you're not late do we give bicarbonate bicarbonate is best avoided for uh, uh, quite a number of reasons because the problem here is not the metabolic acidosis due to uh, due to accumulation of other acids is really the keto acid. So it is correction of ketosis that is important rather than pushing it with bicarbonate. So I would say that we should not give bicarbonate in a, uh, in a normal medical ICU or a ward setup, certainly shouldn't. There could be decision making in an anesthetic, uh, anesthetist or a critical care people do when they are managing these patients uh, in ICU. But by and large, if the uh, pH usually comes up very quickly from 6.9 to more than 7, and you don't necessarily need to give bicarbonate. Um, and the complications, um, as uh, again Jill Sir had said, that the mortality has come down to less than 10, which is true, and uh, that is it's uh, reassuring. But I think we should be able to bring it down to, uh, you know, to negligible figures, less than 1%, um, if managed properly. The unfortunate thing that happens sometimes is the cerebral edema, especially in children. Uh, and this could be due to different reasons. Uh, could be due to sometimes a rapid correction, uh, also a rapid fall in blood glucose. So managing these patients uh, very closely is perhaps the trick there. So this is kind of a summary of what I have uh, 
kind of set so far. So the three cornerstones of therapy of decay being the IV fluids, the insulin and potassium. And if you have managed these three uh, very well, with uh, if your staff are trained to do this properly, then most cases, almost all cases, you will end up with full success. So I think most of these are general care and all that I'll skip. So the last, couple, last slide, uh, just a couple of potential pitfalls uh, in diagnosis and management decay. Uh, just remember that, I mean, we all say that, oh, let's smell of acetone on patient's breath. It's, it may not be apparent. There are many people who are anosmic for acetone. So just because we couldn't smell doesn't mean that we are an inferior doctor. It is just that our, uh, you know, our nose is not, uh, not good enough to smell it. Because I'm sure our, we all remember our third year and final years when you know, our professors used to say, you can't smell it? Oh my God, you know, why didn't you, why, why can't you smell it, sort of thing. So that is uh, one. The second is fever. Fever may be absent in the presence of infection. Um, and so just don't go by pyrexia to make a diagnosis of infection or not. The infection might be uh, harboring underneath. Leukocytosis, we all know that neutrophil count may be not specifically raised in this situation. Okay, so that, that's also another uh, tricky situation. Um, serum sodium concentration, as I said earlier, uh, you could have pseudo hyponatremia because of the very high uh, levels, uh, which will correct itself. You don't need to go and correct the sodium independently. Once this whole situation corrects, the sodium also will correct. Potassium, as I said earlier, definitely need to be replaced properly. So it is so important, if nothing else, as important as checking the blood glucose, or in fact more important than checking the blood glucose, would be checking the potassium, because you don't want to uh, slip there. The creatine concentration, you might see that it's falsely elevated. This is due to assay interference by ketone body. So, uh, mild elevation creatine during a this thing, don't get too much worried because you need to reassess that once the patient is stable. Urine ketone testing, this is again something which we quite commonly find. Uh, it may show negative or trace results uh, when lactic acidosis or alcoholic ketosis coexist. You know, we, we do see this in the, because the patient would have uh, corrected, the, the DK would have corrected, but the ketones would show as trace. So don't. If, if everything else is improving, disregard that. Also, initially when you actually correct, the ketostic reaction may become temporarily stronger. So that's, all, that's also something which we see clinically during treatment of decay. This is due to conversion of beta hydroxybutyrate to acetoacetate. So initially because of that correction, so you do see this because some, they come with two plus uh, urine ketones and then sometimes it becomes three plus, but the patient is actually getting better. So I think that it's not something to get worried of. Uh, it is just that conversion that causes it. And uh, the serum transaminase and CK can also be non-specifically raised, which will all correct itself as time goes on. So I'll stop there. I think uh, for want of time, I won't go into HHS. I'll uh, stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arun for the excellent presentation of diabetic ketoacidosis in a simple way. I think you are having a lot of uh, questions. You are, at the same time, you, are, you all people are having very good experience in treating diabetic ketoacidosis. And so it is a time to clear your doubts and to share your experiences in managing diabetic ketoacidosis. Please. Yeah, I, I didn't go into that euglycemic decay very much. Uh, by and large, it's not very much different. The, the problem really comes in making that diagnosis because if you are too much dependent on the blood sugar reading alone, you might think that decay is not a possibility. When it comes to treatment, the only tricky bit there is that you might have to start managing with uh, uh, dextrose normal saline. That means dextrose plus normal saline earlier on because you have to give insulin. There is no way you can't give insulin. Hopefully, the, uh, the dehydration may not be that severe. Again, you can never be sure about that because dehydration partly is because of the hyperglycemia. So that may not be a huge factor. Uh, but you will need to balance this with 
DNS and uh, so it's it's like the second step of our decay because our first step of decay we are going with normal saline and infusion and then on second step when the sugars start to come down we change to DNS isn't it so it's almost we start at that step in a euglycemic decay no there is there is no harm but this when that is there you might have to start thinking about other causes like metabolic acidosis or lactic acidosis there might be other reasons for that there might be a pyelonephritis or many other things so when that happens you might have to give it but the best thing is to make the decision with the anesthetist or critical care team because clearly now you are in a realm where this patient could go in for you know other supports and all that you know so uh, clearly that that shows that uh, there is more to it than the decay. The simple decays, you, simple when I say straightforward decays, almost always corrects with what we have done. Almost always, I wouldn't say always. So uh, there is no harm in doing it. There are theoretical uh, reasons why there are some protocols that still uh, administer, but they all give a caution. Say that only if bicarbonate persists less than 6.9, sorry, if the pH is less than 6.9, you should be giving persistently less than. Just because first step it is 6.9, you shouldn't give it. There's no need to. It will correct itself. But if it persists, certainly in discussion with the seniors, uh, that decision can be taken. Yes. Diabetic acidosis, GLC, you can share your experiences. Sadhana Yangal I used to look in regard diabetic acidosis management, you have to follow the rule of nine. Number one, diabetic acidosis diagnosis you should not make unless you have not done a anion gap. If anion gap is less than fourteen, don't make a diagnosis of ketoacidosis. Second, acetone positivity alone. It's not a criteria to make a diabetic ketoacidosis. Osmolality, more than 320, go more in favor of a honk, hyperosmolar coma. It is not a diabetic ketoacidosis. Then, uh, so these are the things to keep in your mind. Second important thing is students in them, we have a tendency to make a tendency. When we saw a sugar of 500 or 450, we immediately start intravenous uh, insulin. But this should not be done. You should check for potassium. You check potassium first. If potassium is more than 4, then only you start intravenous insulin. Otherwise, you will lose the patient. Because the treatment for hyperkalemia is intravenous insulin. Now, potassium, 3.5 potassium, pattern 2.5. So we will lose the patient because of sudden cardiac death. So don't give uh, insulin without seeing or without getting a report of serum potassium. So you should look for potassium first before starting insulin. Because if you have blood sugar, you have to have a blood sugar, nothing is going to happen. Third important thing is, while giving insulin, always start with a low dose, 6 to 8 uh, unit to cold, cold intravenous cold. Put it into a drip, one hand, another hand, another normal saline drip. If, if sodium is low, go for 0.9%, ordinary normal saline. If sodium is high, always go for 0.45, half normal saline is the best solution. Always, I am fully agree with the, this good suggestion, always go for a potassium infusion. Potassium auriculum IV direct would carry the road 6. You have to give it in a drip very slowly over a period of 3 to 4 hours. Then, so these are the important things you have to keep it in. One more thing is the rule 7 is, whenever the blood glucose falls to 250 or less than 250, immediately stop intravenous insulin 
and start a DNS. Why a DNS you have to start, then monitor the blood glucose and immediately calculate the dose by the formula and go for a subcutaneous insulin immediately. Then manage with the subcutaneous insulin. So these are the things. Lastly, when you are checking blood sugar and uh, urine acetone every hourly, what happens is we will collect urine from the patient, ask the patient to give the urine and we will send for acetone. The acetone will be positive for two days, three days. Why? There will be a collection. You are in the bladder or nano ml fluid, you are in the urine. That's why we have the urine. That's why we have the urine. Then acetone is going to trace. So the guideline says that you have to put a catheter. Then you will get the fresh urine. Otherwise, what you are taking and sending for acetone examination is the urine which was already present in the urinary bladder. So always evacuate the bladder fully and take a fresh sample so that you will, you will get the correct report of urine acetone every time. So these are the nine things we used to tell the, our students uh, while treating a patient with a diabetic ketoacidosis. Sir, comments? Very relevant point, sir. I think pretty much everything is covered there. So I think, again, uh, I don't know whether serum ketones are now uh, being done in, I'm sure all big uh, setups are doing, but I don't know about the smaller setups. Do they all have it? Again. Major hospitals all I mean, of course, will have. Yes, we have to send it to outside lab. That takes time, isn't it? It will it? take eight hours, ten hours. It's a problem. Is, is perhaps the best way forward, yeah. Yes, I think there are no more questions. We are winding up this session. And uh, on behalf of the AP Cochin chapter, I extend uh, Dr. Arun all the thanks and for accepting our invitation in a short span of time. Thank you.